Hare Krishna. Am I audible behind to all of you? Okay, thank you. So, I will speak today on the topic of uh, from darkness to light. Yeah? Is it better now? Still not clear? Okay. Yeah, maybe a little ahead. If you can come. Last time I was sitting there, isn't it? Yeah. You change it? <laughs> no, but how does that make a difference? <laughs> no, no, but how, why should that lead to changing of the sitting arrangement? <laughs> okay, from the acoustic point of view, that might be better. Because you know, if I'm there, then both sides people can hear me. But I think, is it okay or is it too much echo? No, no, don't say okay just for saying it. <laughs> Should we do that? Yeah, then I think everybody can hear properly. Can I stop? Hare Krishna. Is it better now? Okay. All right. Thank you. So, you know, when we are not able to hear a class, clearly three things happen. One is that uh, we lose interest. The other is that the mind starts filling up the gaps. So, what happens is, anyway, uh, researchers have found that if, ad, if people are very attentive, still they get about 20% of what the speaker speaks. And if they, and if they hear 20%, <laughs> then they get 20% of that. <laughs> so, I was uh, in one place near New York, I gave a class over there. And after that, there were so many questions about things I had not spoken in the class. <laughs> so I was wondering, it's good to have questions, but why so many questions? That everybody was thinking that is what they heard in the class. <laughs> yeah, is it better now? Okay, thank you. So I'll speak today on this topic of from darkness to light. And we'll talk uh, one story from the Ramayana about this. When I was studying in college, uh, 20, 25, 25 years ago roughly, more than that. Roughly. So I found that most students were confused. You know, what should I do in my life? How should I move forward? And, oh, mm -hmm. now I'm confused. <laughs> there are three mics over here. So... So, you know, I was, I just gave a talk in Stanford, after that one mother, western lady, she came and she told me that her daughter has been 12 years in Stanford and not that she's not able to clear, uh, she's not able to pass the exams, she's just thinking, what is my calling in life? So 12 years, she has 12 times changed her major. 
find, oh, what is really my calling? So I told her that, you know, old age is calling you now. <laughs> uh, so what happens, some people are confused. Many people, especially in teenage and youth, they are confused. What am I meant to do in my life? So actually most people are confused. And some people are special. They are confidently confused. <laughs> they don't know what to do, but they are confident. This is what I am going to do. <laughs> so broadly speaking, we talk about darkness. Now there is physical darkness and there is metaphysical darkness. So physical darkness, it blinds us. We can't see. See, right now if power goes off, then you will touch the wall or you will be careful. How can I move ahead? But metaphysical darkness is of a different kind. Where we are not just in darkness, but we are in darkness about being in darkness. <laughs> that means we don't know that we don't know. And that can be particularly disorienting. So the issue of Nishad has, has one of the bewildering verses which indicate this thing. Andham tamaha pravishanti ye avidyamu pasate tato bhuya ivate tamo ya uvidya yamrataha. He says those who are in ignorance, they will enter into darkness. But then he says those who are in knowledge, they will enter into greater darkness. We say, what is going on and how can knowledge lead to greater darkness? So, if you look at the overall flow of the Isha Upanishad, it is saying that not those who are in knowledge, but those who are in so-called knowledge. Those who think they are in knowledge, but they are still in darkness. They will enter into deeper darkness. What does it mean? That means that when we are born, when we live, uh, we, all of us are given some, some purpose in life. Say, we are, we are told, oh, you have to grow up, you have to build a career, you have to you have to get a family, you have to have children, you have to be, become financially secure, you have to get a good position in society. And that is a goal for us in our life. And we move forward accordingly. Now, this is important as a, as a purpose for living in this life. But what about after this? What, what does that mean? Okay, even if I achieve this, there is, there is eventually old age, there is death. What after that? So we have a purpose in this life, but what about beyond that? So those who are in rajas, those who are in raj, a mode of passion, they get completely consumed by the purpose in this life. But those who are in sattva, they think, okay, this is important, but isn't there something more in life? Then that makes them come towards knowledge. Now those who are in tamas, those who are in ignorance, they are so lethargic, they are so lazy that they don't even a, they don't even pursue a purpose in this world. So many children, especially those who are born in very privileged families, now they sometimes just spend their youth, childhood and youth just you know, playing video games and watching movies and surf and just surfing on social media and don't do anything constructive in life. Especially countries which are welfare states where the government will pay you if you can't earn. Then there a lot of people become apathetic. Just don't do anything. So having a material purpose is better than having no purpose at all. At least you are moving forward. Even to achieve something materially respectable in life one has to work hard, one has to discipline oneself, one has to restrain one's minds and senses. So, so you could say that there is tamas, the mode of ignorance, is in darkness. So at one level, the whole material world is a place of darkness. But even within darkness, we can be in further darkness. That means there is no material purpose and leave alone any spiritual purpose. But then there are some people who have a material purpose and they are completely obsessed with that but then they don't think of anything beyond that that is also another kind of blindness and beyond that is sattva where you start thinking okay this is all important but is there something more to life and how, how can I pursue, pursue that so broadly speaking the scriptures talk about raising us from rajas to sattva 
so what happens is that the mode of goodness and the mode of ignorance externally can look very similar they can externally look oh yeah yeah i am not so like some people they may not work very hard because they are detached and some people may not work very hard because they are lazy externally speaking the two can look very similar i was i was in the temple in pune once and one boy came and he said you know how do you become a brahmachari in this temple i said okay now he was hardly ever coming to the temple not coming for programs not to dedicate one's life is quite a serious kind of i said oh, what how did you get interested he says actually uh actually i am going to decide by sunday whether i am going to become brahmachari or not <laughs> oh really i said what is happening on sunday he said i have proposed to a girl <laughs> <laughs> if she says no i'll become a brahmachari then <laughs> so now frustration is no qualification for renunciation <laughs> now frustration may direct us towards renunciation that's okay but unless one has some positive purpose one will not be able to continue so basically there is so wanting to form a relationship that is rajas if it doesn't work then you're going to tamas in the mode of ignorance but you want to go towards the mode of goodness and above that's why there has to be knowledge there has to be a sense of purpose okay if i want to renounce the world why do i want to renounce the world what do i want to do after renouncing the world after there has to be some positive purpose otherwise what happens externally ignorance and uh, goodness can look very similar and many people who are actually in ignorance they often use their spirituality to be irresponsible mm. and when that happens then they actually create trouble for themselves in the long run and they alienate others also so bhakta sadan sir thakur when he encountered this kind of people bhakta sir thakur was the first uh, acharya in our tradition who instituted like a monastery mm. where many many people would live as renunciates and shri prabhupad followed that to some extent So there's one very astonishing quote of Bhakti Rasa Thakur. He says, "I am simply trying to create some passion, mode of passion in our devotees. Mm. I'm simply trying to elevate devotees to the mode of passion. Mm. We think we want to elevate people to goodness and transcendence, but mm. often we can just settle into lethargy, apathy, laziness. I think everything is fine. So there are different kinds of darkness. There's a darkness in ignorance." where one doesn't care for anything material or spiritual and there's a darkness in passion where one cares is get so obsessed with the material that one can't think of the spiritual at all a devotee from russia was once telling me that he gave a class or uh, uh, that where he spoke that you are not the body you are the soul and then one person asked a question yes okay if i am not if i am not my body then whose body am i <laughs> <laughs> they're convinced i am the body so if i am not my body then whose body <laughs> so it's very difficult for people to rise to the level of spiritual knowledge now what will raise us is not just frustration it is actually a strength a sense of purpose a sense of purpose means what do i want to do with my life i can have a sense of purpose in the mode of passion and i can have we can have a sense of purpose in the mode of goodness but the sense of purpose is very important so all of us are at different levels of darkness and we are all trying to come to light trying to understand what is truly valuable so if if there is darkness what happens is no we can't see things properly so if we if there is a room is suddenly dark and we know there is a jewel somewhere which has fallen down now we are trying to catch the jewel in the darkness we might pick up a stone and think it's a jewel in the darkness we can't see what is truly of value similarly when we are in spiritual darkness we can't understand what is truly of value and thus we might give up things which are very valuable for things 
which are not that valuable, which are even trivial. So often when we have say a close encounter with death, say somebody near one near us passes away or we ourselves go through a close accident or whatever. So there's one devotee, uh, he told me, uh, Mataji told me that I was at their house staying there, he said that she is very very cleanliness conscious. Now it's good to be cleanliness conscious but she was driving to her work and suddenly a truck hit her and she was late so she had just rushed out of her house and when the truck hit her car, her car went round and round and round and she said, the first thought came in my mind was, oh if I die and people go to my home, they will see my home is so unclean. <laughs> <laughs> now cleanliness is important, definitely, but you don't have to think about cleanliness at the time of death. That is the time to think about Krishna. So, now what happens is if we are not in proper knowledge, we can't see the actual value of things. So, we might value, the cleanliness is definitely important, no doubt. But it's, it's sattva, beyond that there is something much more valuable. So, when we don't have proper knowledge, our mind latches on to something and then holds on to it. The mind does not have a sense of perspective. That means what is more valuable, what is less valuable. What is more important, what is less important. If the mind just holds on to something, this is what is matters, this is all that matters. So we are all in darkness in that sense that our mind has latched on to certain things as very important. And now there are things which are of ultimate importance. Those we neglect because of whatever our mind considers to be important. Now it might be, oh, I just want to get this particular raise in my salary. I want to get this particular promotion. I want to get this. I want to buy this kind of house. I want to buy this kind of car. Now all these are okay. If we can get this, that's, that's, that's good. But if we become so obsessed with this that we just can't think about anything else, then that is unhealthy. So darkness, when, we talk, when I said metaphysical darkness, what it means is, in that darkness, we don't understand what is really of value. So those which are of little value, we hold on to them so much that we lose things which are of ultimate value. So it is our connection with Krishna, it is our Krishna Bhakti that is of ultimate value. That is what is going to last for us forever and that is what is going to give us strength even in this life. Whatever it is of value, it is important for us, but it may be lost and even if it is there, in times of distress, it cannot necessarily give us shelter the way Krishna can. So this now, there could be two extremes, one is that we think everything in this world alone is of value and Krishna is of no value and the other extreme is that Krishna alone is of value and everything in this world is of no value. While we are living in the world, whatever is in this world is also of value but not so valuable that we lose Krishna in the process and our service to Krishna. So with this background, let's look at the story of in the Ramayana which talks about moving from darkness to light. When the Vanaras were sent by Ram to see, uh, to search for Sita, so Vanar Dutta Preshak Rama can you repeat? Vanar Dutta Preshak Rama So Vanar Dutta, he sent the Vanaras as messengers. Preshak means sender. We have uh, one of our leaders in our moment, his name is Hanumat Preshak Swami. So Hanumat Preshak, one who sent Hanuman, that is Ram. So Vanar Dutta Preshak Rama Vanar Dutta Preshak Rama so then as they were, as he sent them away, they all were searching, searching. And Sugriva uh, had given all the Vanaras a time limit. Just search for Sita, go in the four directions and come back within one month. And sometimes some um, intimidation is required. So he had said, those who do not come back within one month, they'll be punished. Now among all those, who had gone, they were most hopeful that the, those who had gone southern direction will find Sita. Why is that? 
Because they saw Ravana taking that to the Yes, they seen Ravana going in the southern direction. They had seen in the sky. So, so that's why when Hanuman was going, they had given, Ram had given Hanuman a signet to give to Sita if he met her. So now when they were going, they searched. You know, it's, it's actually, you know, if, if you have to search, it's not very easy. I was at a farm community and there the devotees told me that one of the family members who was staying in the farm only their child was lost and they had like a whole search team they were searching 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 it's like in the, there is a there is a, it's a two two and a half three year old child just gone out and they said yeah, go, go, suppose go and sit in the car the pa- father went inside the room came out and the child had disappeared so I was searching everywhere now there are lakes there are there is a there's a forest nearby how when you start searching so what happened? Because it was a it was a place of a devotee community over there. So the devotees told here and there, and then they, now this is not an uncommon occurrence in that area. So they have like a search and rescue squad. So that they call they call the government and the, the police and the police send the search and rescue squad. And then they started searching, but they found that now this this kind of thing had happened many times before. But Western society broadly is very fragmented. You know, people live all alone. People don't really care how much for each other. But these devotees, they were living in a community and they were all together. So when this news spread, like within like half an hour, within half an hour to one hour, almost like hundred devotees from different parts came over there. They said, "We also want to search. We want to, want to search." And the first, the government authority said, "You know, we are we are trained searchers. We will search for them. We don't want untrained people to mess up with this." Mm. But then they said that actually, you know, there's such a big area. How will you search for all of it? If you don't find a child, so then what? And then finally, they said, that the devotees are upset. How, he says, you know, it's a child is lost. How can we not search for him? And finally, said, okay, you go with our teams. And they started searching. And just because, now it was not a very big place. It's like a town. And 100 people coming to one place, it, it just spread. And then the, the local TV channel came over there. <laughs> so, then they, then they, they interviewed the 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 search and rescue squad in charge who was there at that time and he said you know so what has this happened for you before that a child is lost and so many people come he says this never happened before in my life mm-hmm. that so many people come together and he says what is your reaction to that so he said as a as a as a professional i am concerned that there are so many untrained people searching but as a human being he says, seeing this restores my faith in the goodness of humanity so seeing this, people coming to support each other in times of trouble, it's like, um, it's, it's rare. It's, many times what happens is that we have many friends, but all those friends disappear when our fortune disappears. <laughs> so it's so basically, but the point I'm making is that searching for someone who is lost is not easy. It requires a huge effort. And where do you search? So they had such a big territory to search. They would go into caves and they would go into deep forests and go into wherever they could. They came to the Vindhya mountains and they were searching. They were searching, searching. They got completely tired. And they came to an area where there was no water and there was no edible leaves or fruits. They were searching, searching. And they were already a month had passed. They were disheartened. They were exhausted. And then they saw a cavernous hole in the mountain. And then they saw their birds flying out. And those birds had wet wings. Oh, there must be something over here. And they peeked in. And whether it is a path or whether it is a fall, it is not very clear. So then they decided, there is no other way to go, let us go here. So they held on to each other formed a chain and started going slowly inside. And it was a dark place, they couldn't see anything anywhere. They just kept walking, walking, walking. Now, some of them became nervous, you know, are we going into a, like a dark place and we find nothing and we'll get exhausted and we we'll die inside. But then they remembered that they were already thirsty outside, there was no place for water and these birds were coming. They kept going, 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 going. And finally, as they went deep into the cave, Suddenly they saw a light over there. And it was a bright shining light. 
and when they entered into that light that's when they saw that it was not just a light it was like a mansion over there the the cave itself led to a mansion and there were magnificent places for seating and there were beautiful trees which were having effulgent uh, leaves to it there were flowers and there were fruits and there was a lake and it was more palatial than any palace the monkeys had seen and they started looking what is this where is this they started thinking that this kind of opulence is this some demon it's a demon and have we walked into the demon's den and they were tense and as they were looking around to see some kind of activity they suddenly saw somebody sitting far away they just tensed and as they went over there further they saw that it was a female and she seemed to be sitting in yogic meditation and they went close to her and then she turned and she had a effulgent face and they could see that she was like a she was a yogini and she looked at them and then among all the vanaras hanuman was the most uh, most soft spoken hmm. now hanuman he had already angad was the official leader but hanuman was the person who had vak shakti when I mean, first time when he had met ram just by speaking and he spoke ram felt so pleased this is his voice is so sweet his words are so sweet yes and he is such a person hearing such a person just hearing them will give us will make make the fatigue of the mind go away now when we speak in general most people are agitated everybody has so many issues going on in their lives so when we speak should speak to give others peace of mind but often we speak to give them a piece of our mind <laughs> and when we give a piece of our mind it is often not the best piece it is often the harshest speech the speech so what happens when you speak it just can sometimes alienate so this is hanuman you go ahead but hanuman want to know do speak very softly speak very nicely so actually it's a very very valuable skill to develop that how we can speak in a way that makes friends not enemies speak in a way that doesn't alienate people by attracts people krishna said this is the austerity of speech anudvegakaram vakyam satyam priya hitam chayat swadhyaya abhyasanam chaiva vanmayam tap uchyate he says discipline of speaking means speak in a way that is not agitating to others speak in a way that is truthful that is beneficial that is pleasing and that is in harmony with scripture so hanuman is expert in this chanakya pandit says in fact that to conquer the world you don't the a rule a king who wants to conquer the world more than skill in swords swords the king the king the conqueror needs skill in words but if he has skill in swords he can fight but if he has skill in words he can inspire others to fight mm. and to win you just don't need your own expertise you need the capacity to inspire others so now when the and hanuman went over there and he said oh or oh, oh lady oh yogini he said we are lost over here we are hungry we are thirsty and what is this place it is so astonishing and you we were fearful that this might be a place of a demon but seeing you performing yogic meditation seeing you so serene we are intrigued this cannot be a demoniac place please tell us where are we and he spoke so gently so respectfully he appreciated the place he appreciated her and he expressed her apprehension is apprehension also but in a way that did not come out like a accusation we thought it's like this but but it doesn't seem like this so who are you so you know when we meet people our words can either open windows or our words can build walls and then if we have build walls then we have to work to break down all those walls afterwards otherwise it becomes very difficult 
actually connect. So then Swayam Prabha was pleased and now she also had mystic power. So by mystic power she understood that these are Ram's servants. And she knew who was Ram and she said that this is actually a mansion built by Maya Dana. Now Maya, Maya, uh, Maya is the illusory energy but Maya, 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 not Maya, Maya is, a, is a, the architect of the Asuras. Vishwakarma is the architect of the Devatas and Maya is the architect of the demons. So the demons had told him to that they wanted to conquer the heaven but when they couldn't conquer the heavens they said let us make a replica of heaven on the earth and then they created this and when Maya, Maya created this at that time he created this and he started living over there and the demons would come and live over there sometimes. But then when Indra heard about this, Indra realized that this having a heaven on the earth will disrupt the cosmic order. So he decided to attack Maya. But he, uh, but Maya was very powerful. He had got blessings by the power of Brahma. So then he talked with Brahma, this, this is he's disrupting things. So then they sent an Apsara. Her name was Hema. And this Apsara allured Maya and becoming intoxicated uh, with her, Maya lost his senses and then Indra attacked at that time and Maya had to flee from there. Now some people say that Maya was killed and he was reborn later. I will say he just fled from there. The Raya and the Raya, different recensions, different recensions of the Ramayana is slightly different. But basically Indra, Indra got that and because Hema had helped him. To get that, he he told that this is a gift for you. You live over here. And Swayam Prabha, this, is, this yogini said, I am Swayam Prabha. And I was an assistant and friend of Hema. And Hema lived here for some time. But then Indra told her, you please come to heaven with me. And when she was going, she told me I need somebody to, to care for this. She says, can you take care? But then she said that if I am all alone, how will I take care? Uh, she's, uh, so Emperor said, I am all alone. How will I take care? How will I, I want to speak of protecting it, how will I protect myself? The, my, uh, Hema, at least people knew that she was an Apsara of Indra. So if anybody did anything, or Indra would come and attack. She says, she says, I will give you mystic powers. She says, you do this yogic tapasya, by this you will get mystic powers, nobody will be able to harm you and you will be able to protect this and uh, I said that since then I have been waiting over here and I have been performing austerities and I can see that you are hungry you are thirsty so please have as much food and water as you want and Hanuman was looking now all the monkeys were looking from behind while Hanuman had been telling asking and Hanuman telling the story when they heard can I have the food they all been so hungry just ran and just ate as much food as they could and after that their hunger was mitigated and they felt relieved then then Maya said that so then uh, Swayam Prabha said so now that you are recover now that your hunger fatigue and hunger have gone can you tell me who you are and what are you doing here then Hanuman told their story of how Sita had been abducted, how they were searching for Ram. And she heard the whole story. And then she said, now the Vanaras had walked a long, long, long distance into the cave. And he said, now that we have satisfied our hunger, uh, we would like to take your leave. So Swayam Prabha smiled and she said, that for the protection of this palace, Maya has arranged in such a way that yad gatva nanivartante <laughs> once you come in you can't get out this is the path of no return he said that but you know we saw the birds coming out from here he says birds can go because they will not create any harm humans cannot go he said we are vanaras he said, the vanara it's a, sometimes we call them as monkeys but they are not simply monkeys you know 
it is they like we see in the ramayana they, they talk so they talk they, and they don't just talk they have human intelligence not just like human speech they also have spiritual inclination isn't it they the vanaras are devotees of ram so the capacity for spirituality is typically a human attribute so the word vanara what it means is va nara is this a human being va wow. is or it looks like a monkey but is this a human being va nara another meaning of the word is one nara the forest humans so they are not just monkeys they are uh, they are special beings who existed on the earth and they were quite evolved some of them were more powerful than humans also says because you have human consciousness you cannot go out now when they heard this this the monkeys were panicking we can't go out but then hanuman looked at swayam prabha and he said you know i'm sure sh- sure you know how to go out please help us he said that this is the arrangement for protecting this key, this mansion that if somebody comes in and then they go out they will tell everyone this mansion is there and then plunderers will come and plunder everything from here so the plan is so that anybody who comes in they can never go out just please we are on a mission to serve ram we have to find sita please help us come out then i'm sure you know some way so she looked at anu anuman was busy says you know ram will be in separation they are already late please so now uh, swayam prabha said okay there is one way he said that the purpose of not being able to come out from here was that nobody should be able to detect this nobody should be able to find this place and tell others he said all of you close your eyes close your eyes and i will take you out by my mystic power and now the vanara said okay the vanara closed their eyes and as soon as they closed within a few moments they said so swayam prabha said open your eyes and they opened and they saw that they were out and she said here you see these big mountains this is the, the vindhya mountain range and in front of you is the southern ocean and so he said now i have brought you out now i now i will go back into my cave to continue my austerities and hanuman thanked her and she disappeared now the vanaras realized that the place they had come out was not the same place they had entered what she had done was she had they had entered into the cave that these mountains were big mountains they had entered from one side and she had brought them out on the other side and because they had to go to the go to the southern side so they had she had brought her right next to the southern ocean so the vanaras felt relieved they had been rejuvenated they had been they had got food they had got water the tiredness had gone and by swayam prabha's grace they were out now and right next to the ocean to search they all became jubilant yes now we will find sita and they started charging ahead so now the story in the ramayana it illustrates the principle of obstacles on the path of service See, when we live in the world we all face difficulties even when we are trying to serve the lord trying to do our dharmic duties then also we face difficulties and just as the vanaras amidst the difficulty entered into a cave deep in hoping to find some relief from it so sometimes you know when we face some problem at that time we we find some solution and we enter into that solution okay this is what i am going to do but sometimes as we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper we seem to get more and more lost so broadly speaking in our life journey there can be two distinct kinds of obstacles one is trouble 
and the other is pleasure trouble means that you're going along the way and this this is so difficult this is so troublesome i just want to give up so we're going along the path and we feel this path is too difficult i can't go ahead that's trouble and pleasure is that you're going along this path why do you want to keep going it's so enjoyable here why do you need to go any further so trouble deters us by saying it is too difficult to go on pleasure deters us by saying what is the point of going on you already got pleasure so we see in this cave the vanaras faced both of these as they were going in and they didn't know whether something would be there it was dark 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 they were just going on and on and on sometimes we are in our life and there's so much darkness all around us just don't know what to do at that time so we go through dark difficult phases in our life and at that time what did the wanderers do keep walking keep walking keep walking one step one step one step sometimes in our life we go through hell the hell is not just a place where we may go where some people may go after death now almost everybody in the way some relatives depart they write swargavasi or kailashwasi but you know there's no guarantee that they have gone there <laughs> isn't it we don't know where people have gone but it said that everyone wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die <laughs> so that is a paradox but what happens for all of us we may all go through hell in this life itself that means we may have hellish difficulties so the key thing if we are going through hell keep walking don't stop walking because what happens in life we can go through extreme difficulties but just as the pleasures of the world are temporary the troubles of the world are also temporary if you keep walking keep walking the troubles will get over so the wanderers kept walking kept walking so in trouble we might get disheartened why the wanderers could have said you know we are doing service we are trying to find sita we are doing this for ram we are not even doing this for ourselves why such difficulty they could have blamed they could have become disheartened but they didn't do that they just kept walking kept walking kept walking it's a long dark they didn't know whether something would be there but just keep walking keep walking so oh, when we are in trouble it's best to just keep moving on and on and on so take small steps whatever we can now, faith means to take one step even when the full path is not visible faith means take one step even when i can't see the full path keep one step one step that's what the one that study so that's one kind of trouble one kind of obstacle the other is pleasure when they finally got to the cave where there's a inside the cave there's a mansion now they had comforts over there they had abundant food abundant comforts they could just have lived over there and when swayam prabha said also you cannot get out of here now none of the wanderer said oh, can we stay here itself then we'll enjoy over here no they remembered their purpose that can you tell us how to get out of here no nobody can get out of here no but you must know some way please tell us so often pleasure can also be an obstacle because what happens in pleasure we settle into comfort and complacency your yeah, life is good one of my relatives i was trying to talk about krishna consciousness to him and he was he told me he says you know i believe in god he is happy there i am happy here <laughs> <laughs> now the problem is that okay i may be happy here but for how long you know the good phases in our life it's not that we want them to end but nothing is going to last forever the world the bhagavatam gives an example it's like if a frog is there in a puddle then the frog feels comfortable there's all nice water all around me but it's summer and the puddle is drying the puddle is drying and then that aquatic if it's not just a if it's a loose in water basically then when the water dries it will die so we might be in a comfortable situation right now but no comfortable situation also is going to last forever 
So even when we get to comfort, we need to keep moving onward. Now, Swayam Prabha, what does her name mean? What is Prabha? Light. Swayam is? One's own, Swayam Prabha. So Swayam Prabha means self-effulgent. So she did not need light to come out of the darkness. She was self-effulgent. So the so Swayam Prabha can be said to represent our spiritual guide. When we are all in darkness, the spiritual guide is what we need to find the way. Now, just as she initially provided comforts, oh you are hungry, have this food, have relax. So similarly, you know, when somebody comes to a spiritual place, the whole idea is that we care for the soul, but we can't say, I care only for your soul, I don't care for your body at all. It's not like that. We care for the complete person. That's why Prabhupada said that if somebody comes to a temple, we give them prasad. Do we give them delicious food? Prabhupada said if they come to the temple, look, let them see the deities and even if they don't appreciate the deities as the Lord, let them just see the beautiful beauty of the deities and they feel peaceful. Oh, this is so attractive. This is so nice. And then they learn about spirituality. They become a little more receptive. So the Swayam Prabha, she offered them what they needed materially. And then they could have settled for that. But they did not. Now they have to they are intelligent. They they could they observed if this was all thing this whole mansion was so comfortable, then was why was Swayam Prabha not living like a queen over there? She was doing yogic austerity. Because there is something more. All those comforts, they might be great relief when we don't have anything. But what after that? Generally for all of us, there are certain basic necessities of life which are vital. So for example, if we consider wealth, everybody needs money. And researchers have found that between, say there is a correlation between wealth and happiness. So what is that? Initially, it's like a straight line. If people don't have the basic needs of life, then absence of wealth causes great distress. And as they start getting their wealth, then the distress starts going. But beyond that, there is no correlation. The correlation becomes completely hazy. Now, to make money is important. But what we make with money is even more important. What are we doing with money? Like suppose somebody, you see, they are they're rushing out of their home to go to a car, to the, go to their car. And we ask them, where are you going? He says, I'm going to put fuel in my car. I'm going to the gas station. Okay, but what after that? Oh, then I'll go to the next gas station. <laughs> oh, really? Then after that, where are, you going to, where are you driving? Oh, then I'll go to the next gas station. <laughs> but where are you driving? No, I'll drive to the next gas station after that. <laughs> Obviously, if you have a car, you need gas for it. But what we drive with is not what we drive for. We drive with fuel, but we don't drive for fuel. We drive for some purpose. So similarly for us, the material needs of life, say food, clothing, shelter, wealth, all these are, that is what we live with. And it's required. But what we live with is not what we live for. But unfortunately, when society starts glamorizing what we live with, then, oh, you're going to get fuel? Oh, you know, actually, if you go to this, this gas station, that is for less prestige. You go to this gas station. That is more prestigious gas. Well, gas is gas. What is the prestige in the gas, isn't it? No, then what happens? The whole obsession becomes trying to get more and more things to live with. But that doesn't bring satisfaction to life. Now, what we are doing with our material resources, what we make with money is more important. So if we live only with materialistic people, then we start thinking that material pleasure and material position, that is the purpose of life. And we stay in that darkness. So what happened? The Vanaras <coughs> got the comfort, 
but they had their need the need was fulfilled like i said if there's there's lack of food there's distress lack of money there is distress but then once you have money or food how much there is no limit to that so oh uh, just as you know if somebody has no food that causes distress but somebody has too much food and they eat too much food and then they then they they spoil their health by that that is also causes distress so same way having too much money can also cause distress so they kept moving onwards so it's not that we want to we want pain or we want material deprivation deprivation but rather material possession is not our purpose so the vanaras kept moving forward and what happened through trouble and through pleasure they kept moving on and when swayam prabha dev she brought her out she did not brought, bring her out to the same side where they had gone in they came out closer to their destination so similarly for us in our lives we may we may go through trouble but and we may go through pleasure but if we stay fixed in our purpose then through pleasure through trouble we will keep evolving we will keep moving towards the lord na praharishet priyam prapya no dvijet prapya cha priyam sthir buddhir asam mudho brahma vid brahmani sthitah i'll conclude with one example let's read this say so krishna is saying over here don't be this is 5.20 in the bhagavad gita don't be elated when there is joy when the napraharishet priyam prapya don't jump up and down in happiness when you get something which is pleasant and no dvijet prapya cha priyam when you get something which is unpleasant which you don't want don't become too dejected by that sthir buddhir keep your intelligence fixed asamudho do not become deluded brahma vid brahma nisthita understand that you are brahma know that you are spiritual and keep pursuing the spiritual you keep doing that you will attain the spiritual so this verse is very significant krishna is not saying here that there is no that you shouldn't see things as pleasant and unpleasant there will be pleasant things there will be unpleasant things now we can't deny that sometimes we get the pleasant and sometimes you get the unpleasant if somebody says i am happy in life well okay you can be happy but what is your definition of happiness prahlad maharaj says a simple test to say how actually we cannot be happy for very long in life he says yasmat priya priya vyoga sanyoga janma shokagni na sakala yoni shuddha yamana dukkhaushadham tadapi dukkham tadhyaham bhuman brahmami vadame tavadasya yogam he says that we all want to get the priya with the priya we want sanyog and with the apriya we want viyog we want separation from it but what life does is the opposite with the apriya we have sanyog that which we don't want we get and with the priya we have viyog and because of this what happened shokagni na sakala yoni shudai yamana all living beings are burning in the fire of lamentation and he says what is the solution he says that bhuman brahmami vadame tavadasya yogam my dear lord i have been wandering in this world trying to get the desirable and avoid the undesirable but this has just kept me wandering for a long time my dear lord please instruct me how can i serve you vadame tavadasya yogam through the desirable through the undesirable how can i serve you o lord so that is what we all can pray to the lord for it's not that we we want the undesirable or we don't care for the desirable the desirable come comes that's good but krishna is saying don't get don't jump up and down enjoy when the desirable comes and don't get dejected when the undesirable comes both will come in life it's like say we are going along a path then if we are going to some place say we have uh, a grandfather or some relative has passed away and they have kept we have got an inheritance of 5 million dollars over there and it is going on that path and we'll get that inheritance if we get there but while we are going along some some thief comes and they grab our pocket and they steal the money from there and actually in our pocket we just have 5 dollars <laughs> 
and they take the fight over. How dare you steal this from me? And we start chasing that thief. And we start chasing that thief and we start catching that thief, fighting with that thief. And in that whole process, we just get lost. We just get stuck over there. So now five dollar loss is a bad thing. We don't want to lose anything. But suppose we had to get to that place where we want to get the inheritance, we have to reach within a finite time. And if we waste that time in trying to protect that five dollar, and we lose that time over there, then what has happened? It's a great loss. So a five dollar loss is a loss, but as compared to five million dollars, it is not. It is trivial. Similarly, say we are walking along the road and we see a five dollar bill falling there nearby. Oh, I just lying over there. Let me get it. And we go there and it flies away. <laughs> and we go further. And it flies away further. And we keep chasing that five dollar. And again, we waste our time. See, in the world, what happens? Uh, sensual pleasure appears to be free, but then it comes with an invisible cost. On the internet nowadays, so many things are advertised as free. So whenever any product is free, that means we should know that we are the product. <laughs> if they give us anything free, what they want is, they want us. They want our consciousness. They want our attachment. They want us to be obsessed with it. So nothing comes free in the world. It's free. There are always conditions that apply. So, now five dollar bill, if I can get it, it's fine. But if that five dollar bill is taking me away from five million dollars, to go for that is foolishness. So that five million dollars is our Krishna Bhakti, is our Krishna Prem. We want to perceive and persevere in that. And every day that we are practicing Bhakti, we are chanting the holy names, we are associating with devotees, we are studying Shastra, we are doing our puja, we are taking steps forward, forward, forward towards that five million dollars. And this, this is such a wonderful treasure that actually it is not that we get the five million dollars only when we reach the destination. This is incremental. Every day that we are connecting with Krishna, we are becoming internally enriched. Every day that we are serving, we are moving toward Krishna. So, the world's ups and downs. See, when we lose five dollars, it's like we may feel it's how can this person steal from me? But no, it's five dollars. Don't lose perspective. So when some problem comes in our life, if hey, this is such a big problem, you know, I know some there's an English word called hyperventilate. <laughs> hyperventilate means to overreact. So some people, you know, something goes wrong. Oh, my life is over now. Everything is finished. Well, what happens is, don't hyperventilate. There are problems, but look at your own life. You know, if you look at our own life, say maybe five years before. At that time, you look at your life, every year of your life, you would have had some big problem. And you felt that this problem, ah, it's going to end my life. But now, if you look at your reaction, say, why did I get so worked up about it at that time? Of course, you have to deal with the problem. I'm not saying neglect it. But no need to hyperventilate about it. No need to think that this $5 is such, this is, this is so big that I, I cannot, I have to give up this $5 million. So, yes, don't get overwhelmed by trouble. It will come, it is like a $5 loss. And pleasure is like a $5 gain. If you can get it while moving onwards, fine. If you don't get it, so is it so? Then just keep moving on. Na praharishet priyam prapya. That means it's not that we won't get the pleasant. If you get the pleasant, don't get so delighted by that that you stay stuck over there. If you get unpleasant, don't get so dejected by that, but it's case you're stuck over there. Just stay purposeful. If you keep doing that, then through every single day, we are moving towards Krishna. We are moving towards the supreme enrichment. And if we develop our love for Krishna, now if by the end of our life we love Krishna more than the world, then the Lord will take us out of the world and we will attain His abode. Where? There is the supreme light beyond all the darkness of the world. And that is life's supreme perfection. So I'll summarize. 
I spoke today on the topic of from darkness to light. Initially, I talked about physical darkness and metaphysical darkness. Physical darkness blinds us and we stop. We can't move forward easily. But metaphysical darkness means that we don't understand what is of truly of value. So in ignorance, people are confused. In passion, people are confidently confused. Hmm? So, in some ways, a material purpose is better than no purpose at all. Because at least we are striving, we are at least to some extent disciplining ourselves, working hard. But to rise from Rajas to Sattva means we start thinking of a spiritual purpose. So, sometimes people equate frustration with renunciation. They go down to ignorance, but they think we are rising towards spirituality, towards transcendence. That's not true. So, we need a purpose in our life. And I talked about how metaphysical darkness, our mind doesn't have a sense of perspective. And because of that, it, it misestimates the value of things. So, material things are valuable, but spiritual is even more valuable. And that darkness we want to come out of by spiritual knowledge. So then I talked about how the Vanaras went into the dark. They were distressed and in the relief they had to go into the dark cave. But they kept walking. Although it was scarily dark, they kept walking. And eventually they came to a very comfortable place. There they got the relief of their hunger but they didn't settle in that place. Even when they told there is no way out, they determinately found a way. They asked and then they were mystically transported out and they were not only came out but came out closer to their destination, closer to the ocean. So similarly for us, during our life journey, we will all face broadly two kinds of obstacles, trouble and pleasure. So both of these, uh, trouble is like a $5 loss, gain is, pleasure is like a $5 gain. But as compared to $5 million, that is our Krishna Bhakti, that is our love for Krishna. So we have to stay purposeful. Even if we go through hellish difficulties, we just keep walking, keep walking. Everything is temporary, even that hellish phase in our life will also be temporary. And even if we get a lot of pleasure in life, that pleasure is also not going to last forever. So, if we just keep moving step forward, step forward, step one step, one step, then we will make sure that through everything in life, we are growing toward Krishna. And the pleasure will not last, the trouble will not last, but Krishna will last forever with us. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Yes, true. How do we know we are making progress? Okay. How do we know whether we are making progress? Uh, broadly speaking, you could say there are three different ways. One is, at the very basic level, Bhakti Pareshanu Bhava Virakti Ranyatracha. That, whenever we practice Bhakti, by that, we are connecting with Krishna. So, Para Isha Anubhav, we experience that Divine Lord, who cannot be experienced by any other means. So, we may not experience this on a daily basis, but periodically, we can, we can feel that when we chant, when we do kirtan, when we come in from the deities, we experience some peace, we experience some calmness, we experience some strength. That is para isha anubhav. Now, this is the internal symptom and it will come, it will go because our inter, inside our mind is very flickering. So sometimes if the mind is too much in the lower modes, we may not experience this. But even if we intermittently experience it, that may indicate that we are on the right track. Then second is viraktir anyatraja. Detachment. Detachment doesn't mean irresponsibility or apathy. Detachment simply means that the things which we were dependent on earlier, we won't be so dependent on them. So you will see that the same problems which may have troubled us hugely earlier, now when the trouble problems, those same problems come, we are troubled but not that much. So what is happening? We are gaining some inner strength. So uh, the relief that we get the, 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 the kind of sublime experience that we get while practicing bhakti and also the decreased dependence amidst worldly upheavals on worldly comforts, worldly security that is also a sign that we are growing and beyond that so, so it's because this growth is gradual we can't perceive it on a daily basis it's we have to incrementally keep moving forwards so it's like say if 
if a baby is small and the chumtham chup children don't want to eat food so the mother says eat food you know drink this milk and then you develop big muscles and the child drinks a glass of milk and then gets a measuring tape let's see <laughs> well it's not going to be that fast then you keep drinking milk gradually it will grow so it's a it's a evolutionary process so every day that we are practicing bhakti we are connecting with krishna that action is like taking food and that itself is going to lead to growth so there will be some moments when we will realize that so the change of desires is not as reliable a parameter of spiritual advancement as change of values because our conditioning is such that desires will keep coming the same thing which we have desired anger might come greed might come lust might come all these desires and emotions they will keep coming but change of values means that when they come how do we respond see if we are spiritually growing then when temptation comes if we were materialists then when temptation comes what happens is we offer temptation the red carpet please come i saw an advertisement discover the passion so people want to become more and more passionate in their lives but when we are growing spiritually when temptation comes it will be red signal not the red carpet so that that change of value that means instead of welcoming this now i am being cautious against this so change of val- desires may keep coming and going and if you keep looking at those desires or emotional responses you might get irritated with things that will keep happening but that because that's just our mind which is fickle but our values when something happens how do we respond to it when something bad happens we might still feel resentful but do we get swept away by the resentment or do we try to fight no i don't want to go in this direction so our, what we value changes so i would say that is something which we can when sudden changes happen in our life just like we measure with a tape occasionally and we see the body is growing the muscles are growing so like that with this change of values is a reliable parameter of spiritual advancement okay thank you yes you were saying you know we uh, have these desires and when we are spiritually advancing um when the desires came the desires come the way we react change changes but sometimes in spite of knowing that we should react differently or we would have reacted differently in an earlier time sometimes we fall back into reacting the same way hmm. so then yeah that's okay sometimes we although no we should not react in a particular way but still we react in that way yes it's like some people say i make a resolution i'm not going to get angry and they start getting angry and somebody tells them somebody tells them you're getting angry i'm not getting angry <laughs> so <laughs> they become angry about being reminded that they're angry <laughs> so i did give a i did a retreat in uh, in where brisbane on burn anger before anger burns you so the point is that if we consider our the graph of our consciousness with respect to time now there are our urges have surges so <laughs> our urges sometimes surge up it's not that that anger or an anger or greed or whatever it's constantly at a high level it it, it is maybe at a normal level and then sometimes it surges up now when that surge of the urge happens we might just get overwhelmed now of course it's good if we can resist that but we don't have to define our spiritual advancement only in terms of what happens when that surge comes so in between the surges what we are doing mm-hmm. so even if we can't resist our urges we can persist between our urges so this surge came up you know i did that thing i didn't want to but what do i do in between next time when the surge comes if in between i am practicing bhakti i am trying to connect with krishna purify myself strengthen my intelligence then gradually what will happen is i'll become strong enough and when the urge comes i'll be able to resist it so that's why in our spiritual life we may fall down but we don't have to fall away fall down means just knock down by the forces which you fall away means we just give up the path 
So sometimes the urges might come and we just we are helpless at that time. What can we do? They are just too strong at that particular time. But what do we do in between the urges? We can either become disheartened and think, oh, I am never going to change. Now, if we are ever going to change, the first thing that has to change is that attitude, I am never going to change. If we start thinking, I am never going to change, this is the way I am, then that's... Now, to lose faith in our potential to improve is the path to destruction. It's, it's a terrible... To lose faith in our potential to improve, that's, that's, that's the worst loss we can have. We, we may feel that this improvement is difficult, but to think that I will never improve and to start justifying that this is the way I am, that is very dangerous. It can, it is actually cowardice. We are not ready, have the courage to fight, and it can be, it can be malice. Ma why? Because what happens is our conditionings, if we give in to them, they won't keep us at this level. They will drag us further down. So that's why we need to have that. At least, okay, in between, let me keep building myself up. Don't let me define myself solely by what happens during the urges. In between, just consistently try to connect with Krishna, try to equip ourselves, try to become stronger. And secondly, with the urges also, there's one key insight that we need to have. Sometimes when the urge starts coming, and we say, no, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to get angry, or I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Then we start feeling the urge is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And we feel, how long can I resist this? Better let me give up now. So, when we start resisting the urge, we start seeing the urge becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. That's when we give up. But we have to understand, this urge is not like an endlessly rising line. It's like a wave. It will grow and it, it will grow and then it will subside. Or another example you could have is like, say somebody is playing an arm wrestling match. No, okay, come on, let's play. Now suppose the other person is much stronger than us and they got our hand down, 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 nearly. Now we think, oh, this person already got it down, it's so much paining to hold on. I give up. But if we knew that it is, a, it is an arm wrestling match, but it is a timed arm wrestling match. You know, it's a three minutes. In three minutes, you have to get the hand down. If you can just resist it for those three minutes, after that, if we can just survive the present round, then we will resume on neutral ground. The next round, next time, it won't be from here. It will be from here. So, we just have to wait till that much time. The mind tricks us into thinking that, you know, this force is going to be like this forever now. And how can I live like this? I can't. Better let me just vent it out now. But it's not like that. The, the urge will be strong, strong, strong. But it's not going to be that strong forever. So, even during the surges of our urges, if we just know this is not permanent, then we might, we, might have, we might find that it's not that difficult to resist it. And even if we just understand this is not going to go on rising permanently, then even if we succumb to it, we won't give in completely to it. It's like when we give in, then we may, we may do far more wrong than what we need to. That's why sometimes they say we are planning to do something and we fall down. And when you fall down, the mind says, now you have fallen down, now fall down completely. <laughs> no, we might be pushed down, but we don't have to be pushed down more than what is necessary. So it's like we might be forced down, forced down, but at one point we give up and let go. But if we don't let go, we might still be forced down, but we won't be down for that long. So basically these two things, we persist between our urges, and when the urges are rising, we understand this is not going to be forever. Just try to hold on. Then again, it's forgiving ourselves and understanding ourselves. Yes, definitely. We have to forgive ourselves in the sense that we have to understand that uh, we have certain conditioning and we can't change ourselves overnight. So, sometimes on the spiritual path, uh, there is self-control which is required. But even more than self-control, humility is required. So what happens sometimes, we might, by, by not being able to resist our urges, we might think I have failed. But actually, 
that may make us feel more the need for krishna that may increase our prayer that may increase our devotion and that humility to call out to krishna might be a bigger spiritual advancement than just success in the self control so forgiving ourselves doesn't mean that oh this is how i am and this is how i'm going to be but okay i could do this but krishna i want to stay connected with you please help me okay that happened it's end this chapter and move on so spiritual life is subtle what is success and what is failure we can't know sometimes we might succeed in self control and fail in humility like sometimes it happens some people fast on ekadashi and they are very strict about fasting on ekadashi they fast completely without water also they are they are fasting nirjal <laughs> and then everybody who is not fasting they are saying this is nirlaj <laughs> so attached was hopeless glutton now when somebody is saying like that then what is happening their body is fasting but their ego is feasting <laughs> so they may not make any spiritual advancement by that on the other hand somebody is they try to fast but you know they just feel so much uh, weakness fainting maybe acidity and stuff like they have to take some food they take that food and they continue their service okay, what happens is that they may succeed because they grown in humility so we don't have to judge ourselves only by how much we succeed in resisting our urges we can focus primarily on how much we are we are striving to connect with krishna okay thank you yes sir Like that who get rejected from life and then they were like okay you know this is the true path in life so is that wrong or is that okay. something that is just okay. directioning them okay is it wrong to have frustration as the impetus for practicing spiritual life no see frustration is definitely one reason uh, why people turn towards something higher in life okay in the, in the bhagavad gita krishna says there are four kinds of people who come to him those who are in distress those who are in distress those who are in distress and those who are in distress <laughs> yeah actually krishna says those who seek knowledge those who want wealth those who are inquisitive that's also there but actually distress is like a common denominator in today's world if somebody wants is inquisitive there can be 100 and million things of they can be inquisitive about why would they be inquisitive about spirituality it must be some something which is gone wrong in their lives so similarly if somebody is needing money nowadays people will go to a bank to seek loan they will not go to god to pray isn't it so basically there has to be some kind of uh, dissatisfaction with life as it is which will make people seek something higher now distress can be the starter of spiritual life but it cannot be the sustainer in spiritual life we have to develop some positive attraction to krishna so i will say that it's not is uh, what my concern over there was somebody becoming a brahmachari because of that somebody starting spiritual life because of that somebody intensifying spiritual life because of that that is good but somebody thinking that i can do this for life just because of this frustration that is not likely to work because in every where the, the this world is a place of distress just because somebody is a renounce order doesn't mean that they don't face troubles just by being in the world everybody has to go through issues so if because of frustration we go from one ashram to another ashram say from we go towards but if you have frustration in that ashram then what will you do after that so distress can be the starter of our spiritual life but to sustain it we have to develop some positive attraction towards krishna or at least a positive conviction about the value of spiritual life in its own uh, on its in its own on its own merit not just because i don't get this so i'll go towards this so either through that uh, attraction or through that conviction there has to be a positive momentum only then we will be able to continue so there is it going from uh well not exactly cynical at uh, today morning we were talking about how 
we might be naive and just believe anyone or we are cynical and believe no one. Uh, it could be that you become cynical about people, things, in this world has no happiness, so let me seek something higher. But the problem is that even on the path to going higher, there are problems there also. So if my purpose, if my purpose in practicing spiritual life is only to get relief from life's problems, in the pursuit of spiritual life also there are problems. So if escaping from problems or avoiding problems is only my purpose, then I won't be able to sustain it. So we need to have some higher purpose to our lives. Now this is the way my consciousness will evolve. This is the way I will grow in wisdom. This is the way I will grow in devotion. So one might have cynicism about people or the world at large. But cynicism can only tell us what is wrong. Cynicism cannot tell us what is right. We have to have some conviction about what is right. If somebody is very cynical, then they will, they will not even accept the existence of God. They will see this... You know, to say that this material world is illusion is, is okay, you could say it's a good realization. But that same cynicism that God is also an illusion. But then what will you do? There's nothing. So cynicism is, is uh, actually very unhealthy overall. Being cynical is like trying to drive your car with the brake pressed full. Only two things happen. Lot of noise comes and lot of fuel gets wasted. You don't move at all. <laughs> So any last question? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for the wonderful class. You compared five million dollars to Krishna consciousness. So that means it's the ultimate. But for many of us, you know, to understand that you know Krishna consciousness is that five million dollars is sometimes difficult. How do we, you know, get okay. convinced? That's a good question. So how do we get convinced that Krishna consciousness is five million dollars? I feel, okay, this is important. See, our state is like, you know, yes, Krishna is good, but Maya is also not bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, that's our state right now. So basically, broadly, you could say there are two ways. One is that we associate with those who value Krishna consciousness very deeply. And sometimes associating with those who have already achieved what we are striving to achieve. And seeing that they don't value that so much, they are valuing this so much. Now that, that can give us a lot of conviction. When I was introduced to Krishna Consciousness, I had this desire. I wanted to be like a, a top student, a topper from a top university and be an academic achiever. And I met many devotees who were coming to class and they were all academic achievers. And they were practicing bhakti. That attracted me. So, so we all have a certain definition of success in our life. And we will be pushing for that a lot. So, if we can meet some devotee who has already achieved that definition of success. And they are still pursuing Krishna. Then that means, you know, that, okay, I am so caught in this. But that is of greater value. That's why the person who has this is pursuing something else. So that, that's one way uh, to get that understanding. That's why Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, associating with like-minded devotees is very important. Now like-minded doesn't just mean we say something and they nod their head and they say something and we nod our head. That's not like-minded. <laughs> like-minded means... <laughs> like-minded means basically our minds work similarly. So, you know, somebody, if we have a particular definition of success and the other person doesn't value that at all, hey, what is the big It's all temporary. Now that, we, not, we may not be able to register it only. No, yeah, everything is temporary, but you know, I need this. But somebody who has gone over there, has pursued that, they will understand the way we think, what our desires are, what our dreams are, what our aspirations are. And then they can present the spiritual message in a way that enters into us. And that's why even when we hear from different devotees, we'll find that with some devotees, when they speak something, it just enters into us. With some other devotees, yeah, it's good, but it doesn't really, we can't really digest it at that time. So like-minded means those whose mind works like us, but is also working towards Krishna at a faster pace than what is working for us, what our mind is working. And through their association, we can get that appreciation of 
Krishna consciousness is more valuable than what we are valuing right now. Another way could be that uh, we, whatever we value right now, that we pursue it, but it lets us down. Means what we value, we turn out, we turn out that it's not that valuable. I was with a devotee from Zimbabwe, and Zimbabwe's current Zimbabwe's economy has gone up and down quite a bit. So he told me that he was he, there was a phase when he went we went to the market to buy some bread, and the currency had depreciated so much that he took a bucket full of Zimbabwean currency notes. And what happened? The shopkeeper threw away the notes and took the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and in exchange for the value of the bucket, they gave him some bread. <laughs> so, now currency can be, it's so valuable, but it may not be that valuable. At all, if depreciation happens. So, now that is because of socio-economic factors, but sometimes something which we consider as very important, so that lets us down. Then, it's not that we reject it necessarily, but that also leads to uh, okay, this is not this is not that important. This I'm I'm valuing this so much, but this is not that valuable. So that way also we can realize it. And of course, one important thing is that we all that there is you could say there is organic renunciation. Organic renunciation means that the way we think at the age of fifteen or twenty or twenty five. And the way we think at the age of 35, uh, 40, 45, or the way we think at the age of 55, 60, 65, it's all different. And most of us, uh, we may have to go through certain experiences in our life before the value of spirituality will register fully within us. So that's why there is the organic way. There are various ashrams. We progress through various ashrams. And uh, at the very least, we may not feel right now that this is just five dollars and that is five million dollars. But even if we don't feel that, if we at least understand this is also important. I may not feel that this is so important, this is unimportant. But we, with whatever appreciation of the value of Krishna Bhakti we have, we keep moving forward. And if we keep practicing our spiritual life as much as we can, while doing our material responsibility, going through material life, gradually that appreciation will also increase. So it's a in fact, you could say at one level, advancement in Krishna consciousness is essentially increase in appreciating the value of Krishna consciousness. That is, as see, we might hear the same Krishna Katha and an advanced devotee might hear the same Krishna Katha. But when they hear it, they are so absorbed, they are so delighted. Now we are hearing it, yeah, it's a nice story. What next? So we are appreciating but not that much. So advancement in Krishna consciousness essentially increase in appreciation of Krishna consciousness, appreciation of the value of Krishna consciousness, the importance of Krishna consciousness. So we can't expect at our level to feel that this is five million dollars. So that's okay. But at least with our intelligence, we can understand this is also valuable. Now how valuable? That will vary. But this is, this is also part of my life. How much? If we hear the philosophy, if we associate with devotees, there will be some value for it. I gave a class in the Bhakti Center in New York on centering our life on Krishna. So it's like a diagram. Broadly, people come to Krishna, you could say, from four different ways. Uh, for a social need, for a psychological need, for a say, cultural need, and for an intellectual need. That means, social need means, People, they want to have a sense of community and belonging bigger than just their family. So because of that, they come to a temple, they come to a, and become a part of the community. Or some people might just want, especially when they, they start becoming parents, they want to pass on the culture to their children. And that, that oh, I want, to, I want to go to a place where I can pray. You can do our traditional cultural activity. The cultural need brings them. Some people might come because of psychological. I'm just so distressed. I want some peace of mind. I want some relief. They may come because of that. And some people may come because of intellectual. They have questions. They are looking for answers. And the philosophy gives them answers. Now what happens is, so you could say Krishna is here and these four are broad paths. Social, psychological, cultural, intellectual. Now, there, can be any, there can be many more also, but you could put them broadly in these. So now what happens, 
because of whatever purpose we have come to Krishna, sooner or later that thing itself will be thwarted. So if I come because devotees are so caring, oh the devotee community is so kind, but then if some devotees behave terribly with me, then I start thinking, how can devotees be like this? One devotee told me, he said, when I came first, devotees fed me fried pakodas. <laughs> but now they are frying me like a pakoda. <laughs> I do this service, do this, do that, do that, and I feel <laughs> So uh, they don't care for me at all. They only care for what I'm doing. <laughs> so now when that happens, so if I have come only because devotees are so caring, then when devotees stop being caring, then what do I do? Then I have a choice. Do I, okay, whether devotees care for me or not, I am coming here for connecting with Krishna. Then what will happen? That very thing which initially brought us to Krishna will become our challenge to come to God Krishna. And then we have to scale that challenge. See, Draupadi was practicing bhakti and dharma with her husbands. But at one particular time it happened that none of her husbands were able to help her. So, she did not hold, she did not keep, oh, help me, help me, help me. When she found that they could not help her, she turned to God Krishna. She took shelter of Krishna. Now, she didn't reject her husband because of that. Later on, she continued her continued her service with her husbands. But the point is, sometimes the very thing that gets us to Krishna, if we hold on to that only, then we will not be able to take hold of Krishna. So we need to let go of that also. So basically, the point I am making here is that, with respect to your question of appreciation, so we all have to go through certain experiences. So we might come because we value some aspect of Krishna Bhakti. If somebody comes because of the philosophy and they get answers to their questions but then sometimes they find some question which whose answer doesn't make sense to them. Oh, but how can this happen? How can this happen? Now other devotees just forget it, you know, don't worry. So I can't forget it. Because you know, some questions are like you could say intellectual banana peels. You stand on them, you slip. Stand on them, again you slip. So some questions, humility in the intellectual domain means to understand that some things I can't understand. I am after all not God. I can't have answers to all questions. So basically, we whatever it is we value, sometimes we will realize that this, am I going to hold on to this or do I want to hold on to Krishna? So, we have to go through certain experiences. So whatever aspect of Krishna Bhakti we value right now, at least with that we connect with Krishna. And then as we go through life experiences, we might value other aspects of Krishna Bhakti also. Or we might value the core of Krishna Bhakti rather than whatever got us there. So it is an incremental process. Does that answer your question? So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki. Gaura Bhakta Vrinda ki. Itai Gaur Premanande. There is one aspect of Krishna Bhakti that is universally valued and that is going to come now. <laughs> that is <laughs> Prasad. So, one devotee was telling me that there is uh, one thing which wakes every devotee up and that is Mahaprasade Govind. Hare <laughs> Krishna, thank you. Such a wonderful class.